So um, we 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 conceptualize this this following panel. Um, I think maybe quite obviously when we discuss about what comes after the nation state, um, we need to talk about the cities and uh, and and also why did we do this festival Trans Europa and Madrid is part of that question because we thought as a as a European network and as a European organization it's extremely interesting to understand what happened in Spain where there is a number of cities that are now governed by citizen platforms, so-called citizen platforms, what difference does that make for the city's inhabitants and what kind of experiences are made here? These were the topics that we have already been discussing also in, in, in workshops and uh, with the representatives from many cities, not only from Madrid in this past few days. At this panel, we don't want to go into that question, but we want to go more precisely into the question of so-called shelter cities, because there are cities around Europe who are uniting under the slogan of Refugees Welcome, and if you've been here already now for a few days, you might have seen that the City Hall of Madrid has a big banner of Refugees Welcome, at, um, not only at, the, um, at their City Hall, at Palacio Cibeles, but at other places as well. So what does that mean, and what is Madrid actually doing about that? So to have that conversation, I'm very glad um, to have Mauricio Valiente, the um, vice mayor of Madrid and the responsible um, city councillor for human rights and refugee integration. We also have um, a representative from the city of Danst, the vice mayor Piotr Kowalczuk and Marta Siciarek, his advisor and um, a, um, an NGO uh, representative or active in an, in an organization that gives support to refugees and migrants in Dansk, in Poland. Um, we have uh, Professor Gesine Schwan, she's a political science professor from Germany and a former candidate for the presidency of Germany and very active in the topic and field of finding new ways to give an answer to the migration and asylum policy in, in Europe, in the European Union that is clearly not working right now. And, um, and I'm very looking forward to understand the instrument and policy uh, idea that she's proposing and we have Juan Diego Catalana from Juan Diego Catalano from the city of Palermo, so a city that is clearly uh, directly affected on a daily basis, um, and maybe from an emergency emergency perspective um, by the situation of uh, people arriving at the shores on a daily basis. So I would like to invite you to come with me now here on stage and um, and have a conversation. And I also will invite you very soon. To, to ask questions that you might have. Thank you. So Mauricio Valiente, um, to my right, uh, is the city councillor uh, for human rights, the vice mayor of the city of Madrid, and um, as I just said, so he's uh, representing a citizens' platform um, that is uh, that is in power here in Madrid, and that I think has already shown quite a number of interesting initiatives. And um, what I want to focus on in this round, as I just said, is. What is the, um, you have put up a banner at the city hall that says refugees welcome and, um, and I know that Madrid is also part of a network of cities that are called shelter cities and uh, I want to understand and I want to ask you what is Madrid in fact doing differently um, in that situation of where your central government is not Ex is not welcoming refugees and I mean, is not supporting the reallocation scheme of the European Union of refugees, but you are, a, you are a city that wants to welcome refugees, so how are you, how are you doing that practically? Hola, muy Hi, good evening, everybody. First thing, uh, as an answer to your question, the first thing is to make visible that there is a commitment, a challenge about uh, 
uh, refugees. Uh, that's why we have this banner at the city council because that hanging from the municipal building every day for everybody to see. Uh, it's about the effect we had with the death of Ireland in Turkey. Uh, just a very huge pressure of the media for a few days as a tranquilizer for uh, consciousness, moral scruples. But, so it's important for uh, municipalities to show that the commitment goes on and that we have made a political decision. Secondly, as a city council, we have no, uh, we can't deal with that, but we are available to uh, receive uh, all those people that uh, should be uh, received uh, in Spain, the government, the central government, has been really uh, reluctant to accept our offer. We have also offered uh, housing to the central government for refugees, but that shows our will, that shows our challenge. We are available of a system of uh, reception that is centralized by the central government because uh, that's what the law says. That should be revised. And thirdly, there's a fundamental aspect. Reception in Spain has to do with resettling of refugees, uh, attention to uh, uh, refugee applicants, but also to the people excluded from that system. And that's where uh, municipalities can do their best. And we have reacted uh, for the people who are refused by the uh, uh, refugee uh, procedures. S our main concern is to give attention to everybody, but without uh, building a parallel system. That would be that wouldn't be good, because that would be uh, washing up of their state's responsibility, or creating a double standards for people that, even though they have an urgent situation, they should be treated equally. That's what we're doing. No, I want to pick up on this last point on the uh, on the emergency situation. You are coming from Palermo, so um, I first want to ask you what your experience is from a city that obviously is is a first point of arrival and uh, not necessarily the last point. A lot of people are traveling through your city to reach other destinations, but uh, but you are uh, you are. Um, you also want to go beyond that uh, simple emergency situation because you are trying to. Um, um, welcome migrants and refugees in a sustainable manner and in fact the city of Palermo has also um, has also drafted and, and published the Charter of Palermo so I wanted to ask you if you could say a few words about that and what this process is, an, is about. Muchas gracias. Antes de todo. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I would like to to thank all the organizers of the meeting. <laughs> I find just Excellent, this idea of choosing Madrid, whose administration is, an, is a great example for all Europe. <laughs> Going to the question, surely Palermo is a border city. Of course, Sicily is a border land, but also Italy could be considered a border city. When we speak of migration, we must have a clear mind about what we are facing. We are facing, uh, we have been facing for s several years that n doesn't have to do with the old s frames of migration. It's about 
a certain amount of people that is this this places that moves across the world and they don't want to go to a final destiny in their journey <laughs> but if we are sure that this is not a phenomenon of migration and immigration, but it's just immigration. We shouldn't uh, face this phenomenon with emergency policies, at least not after two years of uh, its uh, appearance. But we should rather structure a system that would receive and distribute and integrate into the national territory, not in the regional or national territory, but in the European territory. Palermo is too little to receive some 14,000 uh, uh, incoming uh, refugees. Maybe Italy even is too little, but Europe is not. And surely, estas hombres, estas mujeres, for estos Europe, this People, these women and men are o sea, even useful. Si <laughs> if no anthropologically we don't like to help migrants, it, well, from the uh, practical point of view, they can be also useful for society. I find it more uh, fairer. I find it fairer and more. Uh, right to think that they have the right to go wherever they want. But first point, okay? We are waiting for a response uh, from Europe that uh, apparently is awakening from its dream in order to modify the Dublin Treaty. The Dublin Treaty you know, is the treaty by which each migrant must stay uh, at their first arrival country. And practically, that denies the right to migrate and creates difficulties, but, uh, difficult conditions for the uh, for the receivers, the receiver countries, Greece, Spain, Italy, if we think about our future, we must think first that being it migration, is this is not going to end uh, near, nearly. It's going to last for decades. It's an structural change of world society, but also European society. Next generations will have different traits, different colors, so culturally we, we must be ready to admit it. I think this is, uh, I wouldn't like to, I, I, I Daphne told me I have four minutes, so I don't want to speak too long. That's where the Palermo <laughs> Charter was born. I, it's good to mention it because uh, it's no political intellectual provocation. It's just a principle declaration to move to this place must be recognized as an uh, unconditional human right. Mobility is an unconditional uh, right. Uh, I am a Sicilian. Uh, no hematologist told me until now that there are any blood differences. I think we all humans have same blood. I am a son of Italians. In Italy, we are discussing now the use solid. Uh, somebody should explain me why if I'm not born or I am a son of Italians, why can't I live in Italy? I don't quite understand it. That's uh, the reason for the Charter of Palermo to be born. Uh, maybe sometime we won't see it, pr like probably our children, our grandchildren may see it. We're going to witness the way the societies uh, are going to understand someday that the right to displace themselves, that the right to move, to migrate, is an unconditional right.
Yeah, thank you for that last point. The right Muchas to migration, I think that's... Por último, uh, que has dicho el derecho a la migración, creo que has dado en el clavo. In fact, uh, just hecho, as an anecdote from, because it's, anecdota, it's, it's something we've been discussing on Thursday algo, evening where um, we had a debate with a film director who made a movie uh, that's called uh, When Paul Came Over the Sea that I, that I recommend you to watch it, which is about a Cameroonian that is stuck, that, that leaves his hometown uh, in, in Cameroon because he's expelled from university and he doesn't, ha he doesn't find a job that is good enough to pay the medication for his father, so his father dies and he's so depressed about that situation that he really decides to leave and look for a better future for himself. So he leaves Cameroon and he, he's stuck two years in Morocco to earn enough money to actually pay the high, um, the high fee to the traffickers to take him to Spain and then you, you know, his journey unfolds and he ends up eventually in Germany and he claims asylum, clearly doesn't get it because he comes from Cameroon so he has no chance to get asylum and there he's stuck because there's no ways for him to somehow enter into a different way. So this is clearly that situation because how do we how are we dealing with with people who are coming towards us for probably very legitimate reasons but um, they are claiming asylum and then they are failing this asylum system because it's not made for them um, and we need to find new ways so I would like to uh, pass that um, with that to Gesine Schwan um, who is um, as, I, as I already said is, is is, has a very interesting proposal, in fact, that I think connects to that, if, um, if I'm right, um, because it's, it's, it's linked to... Um, so it's a financing instrument that is, that is giving direct um, financing to cities and to municipalities and to small towns in order to have the possibility and the resources to integrate in a sustainable and holistic way uh, newcomers. So I use the term newcomers to, to speak both about refugees and about, um, and about migrants. And, um, and that's obviously interesting also from the perspective of what we're talking about here because it's, it's an instrument that would directly finance um, cities and towns uh, from the EU institutions or from the European Commission, possibly also for cities that, that are based in countries where the national governments aren't taking part in or aren't nece uh, necessarily pro-refugees or pro-welcoming. So maybe you can say a few words about what you're working on. Yeah, thank you very much, Daphne. I really am uh, impressed by what you are organizing here and I will try to explain it uh, in some words. Uh, you already mentioned some. I was, I'm not a specialist of migration, but I was stuck with the lack of solidarity in Europe in several dimensions, but also concerning the relocation of refugees, and it is especially Greece and Italy, uh, the two countries uh, which have to, uh, to deal with the questions, and the other countries did not show any solidarity, and the whole Dublin system is, so to say, a structurally non-solidary because it's just the ex accidental question of geography which decides where uh, which country has to uh, deal with it. And um, the main idea was to try to turn the so-called refugee crisis, which I would like to call as a, as a refugee challenge, into a positive experience because uh, either you try to deter people or you try to make out of that a positive experience and the, the instrument would be to create a European fund where uh, European cities, municipalities are uh, allowed to apply if they are uh, ready to welcome refugees for the financing of this integration of the refugees, but additionally the same money additionally to their own development. So to make out of the uh, integration of refugees a common development and common means also that it should not just be the mayors or the administration to decide upon that, but that uh, within these towns, a group of multi-stakeholders, which is also the instrument for development policy, namely of representatives of uh, municipality administration, organized civil society, churches, trade unions, but NGOs, and also the, uh, the, the business sector, which is important 
to bring them together uh, and to find common solutions for the municipalities also so that a uh, mayor uh, would uh, apply for such a, or, uh, such a financing could be supported by the city and that he wouldn't do that or she wouldn't do that in an abstract way. That could also be a mean, by the way, to integrate the city because we have uh, also disintegration movements in all our municipality, even if there is not any uh, uh, refugee coming, we have disintegration procedures. And that brings me to the point that we are presently accumulating two big uh, challenges. The whole challenge of globalization, which ch uh, brings uh, with a lot of structural changes of economy, etc., but with it also the migration. And it, for many people, it is difficult to digest so much change. And that goes then together with insecurity feelings, and that goes together with extremism, right-wing extremism, and so on. So in order to avoid all that, you have to find anchors to overcome these changes in a way of participatory democracy. This is another point that I would like to make out of this refugee challenge an occasion to uh, bring about participatory democracy on the municipality level, which is easier, which is more in proximity, and which could really integrate not only the municipality, but even Europe, because in this zero-sum game we have always between Europe and the nation states, it could be a third solution to finance on a European level and visibly and, and uh, very clearly on the European level such a municipality participation so that the people do not only see a big, uh, a big uh, uh, bridge or a big uh, auto route or whatsoever which they have not been involved in but yes, just see the sign financed by the European Union that does not really touch them but if they know there is European money for our municipality to develop together with refugees that brings a totally different way of identification with the municipality and with Europe. So there are several, I, I have learned that the English language has a, of, an of, uh, awful saying, namely to kill um, several birds by one stone. I find that cruel, but I learned that that was the saying. We, in German we say, mehrere fliegen mit einer Klappe schlagen. That is <laughs> maybe also cruel for the uh, insects, but it's not so visibly cruel. But so, uh, to bring several advantages together, a participation, integration, and also to slowly um, uh, help the people to get accustomed to this change and I agree with you, which will not end within the next 30 years. We will have global change in many, many respects and so if you can digest change, you feel stronger, but if you are afraid of change you can't. So this is also a way how to, kind, how to digest um, developments which anyhow will happen, even if there is not one migrant for the moment. And uh, to, to adapt, to learn, to, uh, to confront changes and to make out of that possible chances. This is also a kind of lesson I would like to uh, make possible to learn. Just uh, because, yeah, I think you, you, you said it um, and you used the word that you don't want to, or that you think it's important not to create competition, right, between the different poors, maybe yeah. the, the many, many people are coming here, of course, to look for a better future and they're not coming with many resources, but there's also already people in town who are also not having many resources and we have to avoid to this create. This is why I, I very much suggest to have this additional incentive and I know that research on migration has come to that uh, solution too, that you have to have a positive incentive. You cannot only rely on charity, this is wonderful and I am a Catholic and that is mine, but in general you need also positive financial incentives in, in order to motivate people and also that the national government is not any more obliged uh, to invite them, but this is a voluntary decision making by citizens and municipalities. And if they can decide if their school stays op open because we have new people and new families coming into the city, this is much easier than to impose that top down and, and then uh, to convince them. This is a, a false way. Hey, Marta Sicerek, you are from Dansk in Poland. Um, so, um, yeah, you are, you are 
coming from a country that I think has been in the news um, mainly for a national government that has moved pretty much to the right and is not at all um, a government that would welcome refugees. On the contrary, the discourse is pretty harsh against refugees and, and migrants, but you as a city are trying to do this differently and you're also standing up against that. You are the first city in Poland who has in fact signed uh, the manifesto, um, or this initiative that Gesine Schwan has just um, outlined. So, I mean, well done for that. <laughs> and um, um, can you can you say something from your experience? Um, I mean, both working in the city hall, but also you are working in an NGO directly supporting those people. How this how the situation looks like in Poland, um, where where you are in the situation of uh, I mean, very few refugees arriving um, and a very hostile. Um, government, I mean, how you're kind of dealing with that situation in, in Dansk. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So, uh, yeah, just to comment on what Gazina Schwan said, it's like uh, we have uh, national states that are, uh, in, in Poland, we don't have really an integration or migration policy at all, so of course we need the funding on the municipal uh, level, because the money that the government is getting for integration is not being spent in a correct way, or they would rather send it back to Brussels than spend it on integration. So this, this is also why, why it's important for us, because uh, immigrants and refugees live in the cities, in bigger cities, smaller cities, in the villages as well, and this is where the money and the solutions need to be in place. So this is, this is, uh, this is one thing. And, uh, but, as also you said, this is important that we don't do it instead of a government. Yeah, we have to, the, the governments have to be pushed to be open and we as citizens have to uh, make them do the correct thing as well. So this is, this is one thing and uh, us signing the, the, um, the manifesto uh, is, uh, is a consequence of the policy that we've been making for the last three years almost now. So, so it's a policy on integration because as, uh, as I said we don't have a state policy on that but it doesn't mean that the challenges are not there. There are, and uh, immigration that has been uh, very dynamic to Poland, it goes with Ukrainian cri crisis and war, and uh, that has been happening, so our, cha our society is changing, our cities are changing, and local communities are changing, and so uh, challenges are there, and uh, we felt incompetent about that, and so, so the policy we, we did, it's a big comprehensive uh, policy on, on, on uh, from employment to schooling and housing and health, and it's about building our like our society like host society competence in uh, dealing with with, uh, with immigration and it's about creating basic standards for integration and knowing how to deliver how to deliver services of equal quality and so this is what we are learning and we are in the process it's a big it's a big process and very many units uh, and we coordinated like cross sectorally i work in the ngo i'm not i'm not a city hall worker i work in an ngo but but we do it together it's a, like a common thing it's this is something we share and it's 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 like we have to do we have to do it to the, together and bring in as many people, refugees themselves, and immigrants, and, and everyone together to, 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 to do this new quality. And it's in fact, as I was just mentioned before, speaking to the, to the Ukrainian colleague, it's a, it's, we are becoming, you know, it's a new city with, with 40,000 Ukrainians who are in Gdańsk now and originally 100,000 people, it's like, you know, it's, it's, we, have to, we have to make a new reality together now, right? And this is, this is uh, we have to reflect on that and understand that and, and uh, build it together so that it's the good new quality, yeah? It's, uh, yeah. So that's it. Marta is really one of the heroes and also <laughs> the, uh, uh, one, uh, Mr. Kovacuk, who is here from the city. And I would imagine that not many people in Western Europe know that there is an official imam in Gdańsk and that they do their uh, ceremonies and that once when the windows were crashed of that imam, the mayor of uh, of dance privately paid for the reparation. I mean, you know, uh, here normally we imagine Poland as far away from this kind of um, host uh, 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 uses, but Poland is in general, or the Poles are very uh, open for, for guests. They are guest friendly, but they are not used to these 
uh, who come from the, from the east, but even Muslim people are received, they come more from the east, from proper Chechenia, etc. So they do not come from the near east, but nevertheless, I would like to underline that. Of course, thank you for this voice, but uh, I want to say that Gdańsk, uh, however much I appreciate our mayor and, you know, all that uh, courage, aptitude that we have now, we are not an exception. I mean, this is, this is uh, I would say that the political crisis we have now and going right is like, it's like a mirror to, uh, to mayors and telling them, you know, that, that something wrong is going on, so you have to be more courageous now. Mm. So you have to uh, take action on things. So there's a working group creating now in all the 11 biggest cities in Poland on immigration and integration. Mm. So there will be like a development and then we will try to convince those cities to sign the manifesto and really get involved. And also on the regional level, uh, this kind of, uh, in a small, t small towns, small villages, and, and this is so surprising, you talk to mayors and they completely understand what you're talking about. Of course, they are afraid of terrorism and m Muslims, and they know it's challenging, right? So, so it is, and this is, the, it, it's very political, but, but still, I mean, people, and this, it, it, what TV says is not all that is worried yeah. about, or, or how the re reality looks like, and we have to remember about that. Mm, yeah. Um, I, I want to open up to questions in a moment, but I have um, one more question to you, Mauricio. Um, I mean, kind of linking to that, because uh, we know that um, it's, a, it's, it's often a question of exposure, so-called exposure. So if people are living in a multicultural context, they are also more open-minded and they are more welcoming. And I think Madrid is also um, an example of a city that is... Uh, that has a, a history of multiculturalism and um, and of and of uh, migration as well as of immigration, of, of course. But how can we? Um, I mean, you are uh, you are here in Madrid, and you already mentioned that there is a network of cities in um, in Spain. How can we? Uh, take this to a European level, because clearly um, we are talking here about. Um, um, all of us are, um, you know, we are faced with a situation that we don't have um, a working European asylum system, but we have cities who are, all of, all of you here, cities who are, who are wanting to welcome refugees and also, I guess, from that perspective of um, fighting against the backlash of right-wing populists who are trying to put a hold to, um, to that migration, whereas we know it's a reality that we have to deal with. Sorry, I'm, I'm making a very complicated introduction. But um, <laughs> um, actually, my question is a simple one, I think. Um, how can we Europeanize um, these networks of shelter cities that, that you are part of here in Spain and um, you know, that are not really existing yet on a European level? So how do you think we need to work together uh, cities and municipalities in Europe to have a European answer that works for those people who are coming here. I think I was pointing uh, to the history uh, as an open city of Madrid. It's been receiving uh, lots of migrants from other parts of Spain fundamentally. That wasn't easy. Uh, this must be said. We are fighting for an open city model, for an open Europe. That is not going to be easy. First thing, we should acknowledge that it's a challenge. It's a battle we must fight to open up our minds. Uh, getting here, I was realizing the, the great deal of Halloween festivities, and f it has become an institution. I don't like it, but uh, I don't care. It's not about my opinion, but it has become a, a youth culture issue. And this leads me to a debate I had recently about uh, Christmas, how to celebrate them uh, as municipality. We wanted to show a multicultural image, its diversity, and we decided, well, should we celebrate Christmas? But the example of Santa Claus came. 
It's become a current uh, cultural icon, but 40 years ago it was absolutely, absolutely foreign. This uh, gives you the idea that we must open up our minds to the reality of uh, our societies, taking it as a value and as uh, wealth. Mm. As, uh, uh, as cities, we must claim more funding because we don't care if somebody, whether somebody has documents or not, is it a refugee, is it he or she a migrant, it's a person that needs education, housing, health care, and we must uh, pay attention to that and we must give assistance to guarantee social rights without distinction and there is another bottle which is the cultural bottle with which we can contribute a lot, a lot as cities to build our own identities and at the same time shared ones. I'm thinking of Buenos Aires in Argentina. How would Buenos Aires look like uh, without the Spanish and Italian immigration? And how would uh, Madrid or, or any other city look like without that? Madrid was uh, founded by Arabs. That very fact gives us the notion that that closure, that closeness uh, must be fought. And the cities with this kind of initiatives, we can make uh, progress uh, in that duration. Thank you. Just to integrate uh, the answer. Uh, to my uh, answer to your question, to understand what is an emergency policy and a structural policy, uh, five years ago, following an idea of uh, Palermo's mayor, uh, Leo Luca Orlando, has created another institution for the city, which is the Council of Culture. What is that? Like any other city, we have a city council, but we also have a new council, the Council for Cultures, which is composed by 25 councillors. Who are these people? Who, has, who is entitled to be part of this council? Everybody, all residents in Palermo without an Italian passport. Point. Uh, who can vote uh, to for this council? Everybody, every resident without a, an Italian passport. That means that we have a further uh, 25 councillors that represent uh, the whole uh, uh, set of people living in Palermo without being formally Italian. And this is a, a great push uh, by the, the old city council. This was made because of the concerns, proposals, and answers that this Council uh, for Cultures gave to the City Council. This is a practice in order to understand what we want to convey you, uh, in the sense that we don't know emergency policies, but rather structural policies. Uh, so, um, Palermo's mayor, on the basis of the multicultural uh, history of Palermo, because you can in Palermo you can find a dog, a cat, and a mouse walking together peacefully throughout the city. Because we were Arab, we were uh, Spanish, we were Jews, we were Normans, we have everything. So. 
everything happens in peace. But referring to the former, former point, going through this cultural change, uh, thanks to the Palermo Charter, we make no distinction anymore between refugees and economic migrants, because we have understood that hunger kills the same as a bullet. Maybe if, if I'm shot, I die more quickly, but starving is more painful. Um, I want <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to invite you to ask questions. Please, uh, please raise your hands. I think we have around um, 10 minutes left for that. Um, and uh, just, I mean, one last comment also is that I think, um, because, I mean, we here in this room, Clearly, we are a group of people who are um, supporting this, and also here on stage, there's there's no one hostile to this uh, to this idea that we need to welcome refugees. But we also know that we're in a society where more and more people are voting for parties who are clearly against that. So I think, first of all, it's a duty of us here. That's something that I also said at the very beginning of this festival to to understand how we can become more and how we can uh, strengthen our arguments for those that are against and um, and work together. And at the same same time, I also think why it's interesting to have this discussion uh, from a city's perspective is that indeed there are many cities um, that, or that I want to say it's a, it's a, it's a cross-partisan or cross-party um, idea that many cities want to um, or, or necessary ne ne necessity is the word that uh, cities want to um, welcome newcomers to their cities, whether they are uh, governed by a left-wing party or by a conservative party. So I think that's also a uh, an, an aspect that uh, we didn't say here, but I think that is kind of part of the discussion. But now, uh, please, I think we will try and maybe do, let's just see, um, what's the time? Yeah, well, we have around 10 minutes. So I think you were the first one, and I saw you, and, uh, and you, yes, uh, there's the microphone. Here. Yes. Can you hear? Yes. Like okay. A bit closer. Yeah. Uh, I was not going to intervene until I hear the word, the word hunger. And this is something that I'm very much, I work in Tanzania, I work in the, in the Himalayas, I have friends living in Barcelona and in England who came from these countries. Um, and then I, I, never, I was never for a situation. I love the idea. They don't, they don't, they can't hear you, the translators. Well, when I hear the word hunger, it has it, it reminds me something that deserves me all the time. Because, yeah, sorry. Because the, the fact is that uh, um, that's not my experience with migrants. I'm not talking, refugees is something I won't even talk about it. That's sacred for me. A refugee has all the rights to come here. And what I think that in this complexity of migrants who we could call uh, economic migrants, that would be kind of big category. And they would be kind of people who came here through hunger. People who have hunger uh, and are so really low in the pyramid in a certain country, they have no chance, most of them, to come here. I mean, I know Tanzania. Uh, someone who is a low, low class in Tanzania cannot even afford a, 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 a bus ticket from his village to the capital, Dar es Salaam. Not to talk about traveling through countries with passport, he's already middle class. Without passport, he's, what is the money? To be paying mafias. Not to mention paying the patera. Not to mention paying the juju, because no African would come to Europe to pay a certain kind of protection that protects him from evil, especially if they bring children. That's very expensive also. Sorry. I don't know what it means. It means just, it's a very important question, I think, because the simplification of hunger as the reason for people to come. I know so many migrants, I mean, more than 50, 60 friends of mine, who sold lands in Nepal in other countries to come here and buy their tickets and they can even buy a different name passport because they can not do that in those countries, not here, there you can do. So when you have this situation of distortion, in a way abuse of the system of our, the European generosity, nothing to do with the Arab countries or any other countries like us, uh, so it can be abused. But what, what is know, your question? The question is if it can be abused, 
And then, and then in big ways, so many millions live in these countries with a certain position. If we welcome them so easily, that's mm. a magnet. And I love that, but it has to have a degree. If there is no degree, if there is no way, in a moment or another, you have to close Europe and screen it. Otherwise, uh, it's impossible. So in a way, we, we, will, we are very nice at one point when we think we will not be nice anymore because we cannot afford it anymore because we are dragging people here. Okay, and, and I, then, I got you know, your question. And just yeah. one little question. It no, happened I, just last... No, no, it's the same question. No, only, no, 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 it's just... You have, you have other yeah, sorry, sorry. So, excuse me, excuse me. It's only just one thing that happened last week. When Raqqa fell and the Islamic State acknowledged lost, they told them, cut your beers and penetrate the enemy states. Okay. Thank you for your question. I, I, I want, before we answer that, uh, let's uh, take the question here. Um, the, the lady that is raising your, their hand. Good evening. Thank you for your uh, testimonies. I really admire the culture of uh, welcoming of refugees because of war issues, of economic issues, the policy of uh, municipalities. But my question is, what real resources have municipalities to approach these problems? Because the settlings of refugee people we see in some areas of Madrid, uh, it highlights the powerlessness of the municipal institution to face a better quality of life for them. It seems, yeah, we have principles, but then which resources do we have to be coherent with our declaration? Gracias, vamos a coger una pregunta más. Okay. Well, uh, my question is directed mostly to um, Juan, because um, I heard you talking about um, this financial mechanism, I think the first time one year ago, and I'm basically interested in how the process is going of advocating this idea in Brussels, for example, uh, which is the institution about you're talking to, and how is this going? So, yeah. Okay, since the last two questions were very clearly directed, let's take one more uh, from the lady here. Um, is Hi, um, um, I, I, I want to ask this because, um, in, well, I'm going to ask it in English. Um, have you tried the international level in the meaning of this funding? Because, for example, I'm talking about internal displacements in in, 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 in the places they come from and the cities they integrate into actually, for example, in Morocco, in Nigeria, I mean, they, get, they, they go through walking or um, to these places. Maybe, uh, have you thought, my question is, if we fund those cities as well to be inclusive, to be integrated as well, not only in the European, but also in the places they come from. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think there were questions, but there was a question, um, there was a question to you, um, uh, Mauricio, and, uh, but I would, if you want to all answer them, I would like to invite you. Mauricio, uh, you don't have a microphone, but here. Well, I start by the last questions. The resources to fund, uh, we still don't have any European funding because in Europe is still uh, the, the Dublin Treaty is still uh, in place, so they don't contribute anything as uh, refugee. Uh, help, assistance. Second question, the resources uh, of uh, municipalities. I'm going to speak about the Italian situation. The Foreign Affairs, Foreign Affairs Ministry is the one dealing all the economic affairs through the uh, the uh, local uh, police uh, uh, 
institutions. So the municipalities, they have the duty of uh, meeting and mostly um, not the secondary issue to receive and welcome the minors, uh, refugee minors. Four years, I saw for the first play a disembarkment uh, out of the Italian ship, a six-year-old child without nobody in the world. Going back to the first question, I started saying that for us to migrate is a right. And when we organize a meeting in Palermo, where the right hand of the foreign affairs minister came to the meeting, and while some two, three thousand uh, people were arriving to Palermo every week, the first thing we asked the ministry, the minister, is that these numbers could create trouble. Uh, if it, the situation was sustainable, if until now, if we reason in European terms, numbers are ridiculous. The issue is uh, to reason about the whole European dimension. We shouldn't speak of individual cities, Palermo, Zaragoza, Almeria. We must help to distribute, to scatter migrants according to the uh, ideas and intentions of these people being sure that they are going to migrate inside the arriving countries because they, because they change place very frequently. What does, you, do you know what does also say the Palermo Charter? to abolish the uh, residence permit because it has become lately the best instrument for the Ma smuggler, mafia, dealing everything. Everything is in the hands of the African mafia and the Italian mafia and the European mafia. That, uh, on the basis of the residence uh, permit that most of them can have, they have created the modern uh, model of uh, slavery. In 10, 20 years, uh, this is not the issue. Uh, this is not about, uh, this is about imagining migration as a right, because if it is a right, I don't care how many are coming. And I think that Euros is perfectly able to receive and integrate. Yeah, as for resources, I, I was, uh, you were referring to different settlements, uh, settlements in Madrid, uh, sort of informal settlements. After so many years of neoliberal policies, we have little resources, we have, uh, yeah, some uh, social services. But the main resource is the housing policies. But in Madrid, when we, when housing, public housing work was most needed, some of these houses were sold by the former city council, uh, were sold to private funds. Uh, this is about uh, social policies, housing policies, and this is a real problem. We can't just improvise. It's a long-term issue. There are resources, but there are also difficulties with certain populations that uh, don't want to use the um, structures and facilities we offer. You remember Sarkozy uh, solved the issue paying uh, plane tickets to Romania, to some people. Of course, this is not the solution. This is not our options. We intend to uh, offer attention, even in those cases, uh, social uh, care workers, 
children must and do go to school. That's a fundamental aspect, but there is a deficit, of course. But I think that housing is key, um, mostly with these market dynamics that are creating lots of inequality in the cities. That's my answer to your first question, uh, a very specific one. Um, in, in, um, capacity for reception. The Mr. here was asking about. We could put it differently. Which uh, reception capacity has Tanzania? Which uh, capacity has uh, Lebanon that has doubled their refugee population? Let's not say nonsense about the numbers of arrivals in, a, in Europe because we should be ashamed simply how many millions have there been in Jordania, for, in Jordan, for instance, while you are speaking of our capacity for reception in Europe. That's not the discussion. The discussion is how do we universalize rights and how do we guarantee that everybody can live uh, with full rights uh, in Europe. It, your proposal is, your consideration is false. The main number of refugee people live in the poor countries, and that's a fact, simply. And by the way, you can argue by rights, you can argue by moral commandment, so to say, and you can also argue by long-term interest, and they converge. If you really think in long-term interest, uh, all that comes positively together. It's only the short-term vision which is always making contradictions with them. Uh, I was asked uh, what went on and how to do the political strategy. Of course, I started the idea about one, one year and a half ago, and it is a slow procedure, but this is always the, the, the same for political ideas and political projects. Uh, what we committed until now was to have the conference in Gdańsk in Poland, to have the manifesto agreed by many things. Now we are trying to have the support for this very clear strategic manifesto. By the way, you can see it on the website, if you don't recall the name of my NGO, Humboldt Viadrina Governance Platform, which is long, you might Google my name, Gesine Schwan, and then you will find it. But um, I would like to answer, um, there was one lady here in, in the front row, I think, yes. Um, so the next steps is not only to get the support of important mayors, this is important, and you have always to find the first courageous people, and therefore I'm very so thankful, for instance, for the Polish mayor of Gdańsk, that he has the courage to do that. So they all ask, who has signed else? You know, that is always the question. And only if you have a crucial number. The next point is that I talked uh, as well to the Committee of the Regions, as the Committee of Economic and Social, the Economic and Social European Committee, and for instance, does he the president of the European Economic and Social Council signed the manifesto as a person. He could not do it for the whole council. But there are also activities of the Committee of the Regions. This is another addressee. But I also promoted that in the uh, first now in the parliamentary group of the Democrats and the Socialists in the European Parliament. And I think I can go on with the Greens and with part of the Liberals and with the left. For instance, the, the Green uh, uh, deputy Sven Giegold, who has a uh, kind of importance in the Green parliamentary group, he has also signed the manifesto. So I do step by step. And uh, the idea is now that the European Parliament would bring forward that in the next negotiation negotiation for the financial framework between 21 and 27, 28, but also maybe for a, um, a previous uh, stage for two, three years to collect money which has not been uh, expended and to have a, a demonstration project to, start to find out if that uh, works or not. Um, there was somebody over there, um, if you should not apply that 
uh, uh, over the frame of European cities also in Africa. And you are completely right. Probably you know that there is a so-called uh, Nicosia initiative made by the uh, Committee of the Regions uh, and initiated by a lady of Nicosia, and they have brought together um, Libyan towns uh, with uh, Tripolis and Sirte and Benghazi and other Libyan towns together with European ones. What is your pronunciation of Murcia? Murcia, Murcia but also Trieste and Anvers and, 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 and uh, other towns of Europe to partner. Uh, and you have these partnerships already, even without the Nicosia Initiative. You have partner towns. And to extend these partner towns and to make out of that an international municipal uh, development policy, because there you again you have the same obstacle like in Europe. It's always the national governments which do not want it, and or which um, have corruption, etc. But if you do it on the municipal level, also with Egypt and and Tunisia, etc., it's easier. You can also better install an anti-corruption element. By the way, with the Nicosia Initiative, this is the chapter of Transparency International of Belgium, which has elaborated uh, a charter for the anti-corruption procedure. They do uh, education in these Libyan towns and they also install institutions so that the money is really well uh, adapted. So this is step by step, but what we need is public pressure. Because you know, concerning the means, what we give for all these weapon firms, you know, Rheinmetall, all that, they get much money for the drones on the Sahara. This is very costly. It would be less costly to give the money to the municipalities and to develop them. And also to have, uh, even you could do it in the way of the, there are routes of, of uh, uh, refugees in Africa. I've just uh, um, spoken to the representatives of the European Commission in Berlin. They are more on the trip, yes, investment, and I say you have to com combine the private investment with good governance. You have to install multi-stakeholder commissions and also NGOs, because otherwise you'd have just your profits out of Libya, and you do not contribute to a better governance so that there would be governance perspectives of the people who come along. So you have really to battle, you have to convince, and I also talk to people out of the General Secretariat of the Commission. They all find this a very good idea, but they did not succeed to put it into the uh, speech of Juncker. Uh, obviously, uh, he found too many obstacles on the level of the national governments, because they don't want to lose power. If you give direct financing and holistic financing to the municipalities in Europe, the governments lose power. And power is always a very important thing. So if you are a political log or political scientist, you know you have to convince people that it would be in their long-term interest to have direct financing because they are deloaded from all that hatred which is uh, happening if they have to do it top down. Just to say, you, you know, this is, there is a German sociologue, Max Weber, who said politics is a, a steering of very hard wood. And in fact, you have all the time to work on that wood, and, and, but we need the public pressure for that. Thank you. <laughs> um. Matt, just uh, the few last words to you to, to close. I know Marathio has to go, but you want, uh, but please say a few words. Um, in okay, so, so my, uh, my last words will be uh, like the general like, reflection is that um, I, I never saw a city or a country that is like peaceful when it comes to migration and saying that what you said, like cat and everything, you know, going together because of the multicultural past. I, I just don't believe in that and I think we should be very modest and, and careful about uh, uh, what, what, like, what we think of our institutions, of our systems and of inclusion and so on because I get to see very many people, institutions say we are so open, everything is working great and, and we don't check the reality and being in my, uh, in my work where I meet migrants daily and then I look at institutions daily and I, I try, you know, and it's like uh, there is nothing, I mean we are in a process and it will never finish and it will never be great it's always a struggle it's people using identities and changing identities and all that so so yeah so this is this is what i wanted to say that's it thank you for that you. 
Um, thank you all four of us uh, for, for being here. Um, I thought this was a very interesting panel, I hope, and I'm sorry that we couldn't take uh, uh, more questions. Um, we, we, have to, we have to finish this also because there's two more uh, important items on our, on our evening agenda. Thank you so much. I think um, we got quite a, quite a diverse uh, set of views. Stay here now for the next uh, session on the European Commons Assembly, and thank you very much again for, for